Everybody, welcome. Sorry, we're two minutes late. We had <laughs> we had to do some preparation. <laughs> so, where are we anyway, supposed to be at? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this will be a fun one. We're going to be talking about workforce retention. And there's a reason for this t-shirt. It's about purpose. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we have Scott Poland on here from Sherpa. So thank you, Scott, for joining us. We'll go deep into that. And uh, Jack is back. Adam's back. Gary's back. Hail, hail, the gang's all here. It's awesome. So you guys know what to do. You can hit us up in the chat and harass us. You can ask questions in the Q and A. But I'm gonna um, I'm gonna launch. Well, actually, you have a rant, I think, Adam. So I'll let you rant, and then we'll launch a poll <laughs> to test the audience and see where you guys are at on some of these issues around talent retention, in particular. So. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of less less of a uh, less of a rant, more of a hey, I'm excited for the conversation um, discussion, and I really appreciate you being here, Scott. And pretty in a second, people will get to see your uh, face. Um, but in preparation myself, you know, there was, you know, I saw that there was a study that came out that talked about, hey, we've actually measured productivity declines in remote workers. I'm like, huh, what's that mm. about? And it, uh, you know. It it was it was with people in India doing data entry. Interesting. And then you know, there's a couple other surveys that are out there too that that are kind of similar type results that are in the US. So it, it didn't really feel like apples to apples in some respects. Like I'm not discounting it, but it didn't really feel like apples to apples in some respects. And at the same time, I think including us, you know, every CEO in America right now feels like there's just something not right. Mm. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it, but there's just something not right. And if we all had our way, everybody would be sitting here. And it, man, it's just, it just kind of highlights how difficult this, this really is, you know, because you think, well, logically, there have been companies that were virtual before the pandemic that seemed to be just fine. How did, you know, like, why can't I, why can't I figure this out? You know, like, is it, is an item? And at the same time, you know, I think generally, if you look at the BGW client base, I and mean, there's all sorts of reasons for it, but even, even if people have had more in sales in general, we're starting to see profit margins erode um, for a variety of reasons. One of which is associated with, you know, the kind of the age old, Hey, you can't, you can't BS what's my labor cost as a percentage of gross profit or mm -hmm. as a percentage of sales. And a lot of, a lot of our clients, that number is getting worse, not better, you know, so which, which points to I'm paying people more for a sale, $1 of sale than I had to three years ago, mm -hmm. um, which, which is kind of an, you know, a direct measure of if an efficient or inefficient use of labor. So it, it's one of those things where I, you know, I don't really know what the answer is. I think there's something to probably measuring productivity somehow, you know, in some way. And at the same time, it's a, uh, I also can't, you know, the other stuff that you read about, well, you know, we mandated Jamie Diamond, you know, guys like they were mandated, come back to work. It's like, well, how's that, you know, how's that going to work besides you just got quietly quit on? <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a real conundrum that I'm looking forward to discussion around. <laughs> like, I'll tell you what, productivity, like, in other words, like, is Jamie Dimon going to walk around to Gary's cubicle and say, I know you're in the office right now. I just wanted to make sure that you weren't screwing off on the internet just as much as you were at home. <laughs> the only difference is now you're screwing off on the internet in my office right. <laughs> well having lived in corporate america in two fortune 100s in my career i can tell you there are people that make an art and a science of not working but being present yeah that's, that's, <laughs> what, I'm talking, that's what i'm talking about it happened just it happened before like i don't know what's not gonna happen again <laughs> exactly <laughs> Well, speaking of that, I thought this was interesting. I shared this with the team 
this week, but this was a, an article on Fox Business, and it said most, this is the headline, most financial service services execs who work from home would quit if required to return to the office. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we didn't have that option before, but COVID definitely changed a lot of things. So if you guys don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll just for grins and giggles. So it's talent retention in 2023. And I would love you to participate because we want to just see where you're at. And uh, if what we're experiencing is in alignment with what you're experiencing. So first question is, have you been frustrated lately with attracting and retaining talent? Y yes or no. <laughs> and so that's pretty simple. If you would hit the poll. Next question is, if you've had people leaving your firm in the past year, what's the reason that they've been giving? More money, more flexibility, more advancement or responsibility, toxic culture. Be very curious about that. Um, he, thank you for that lone person that has been hitting the poll. He, this person, one out of 17, come on, y'all. Um, the, the third one is, What's your current office uh, in office work policy? 100% in the office, hybrid, or 100% remote? So please hit that poll. Thank you very much for those who are are playing. For the, we probably ought to have some sort of a Starbucks gift card uh, tied to this, don't you think, Jack? <laughs> Yeah, we should. And I, I, we're not allowed to respond to that, but I'm happy to be the lead respond respondent to those questions because we here, as you guys are experiencing all of this, and that's why it was a timely discussion. So, um, you know, so I'll go ahead and get, share kind of what's going on here with us. Um, we have been frustrated with attracting and retaining talent um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, is that um, uh, expectations of employees and in the, the social media post that I put out there uh, for this session was, you know, okay, who, who rules the world? Is it employers or employees at this point? And, you know, prior to COVID, it was employers for the most part. Um, yeah. It was a, a, you know, a good market for, the, for companies and hiring and everything else, but then it, tables turned and it was okay. And, and I, yeah. I feel like the tables have continued to be turned so that we have to be the ones that are attractive to employees versus employees being pulled into, you know, and, and, you know, what you need to work at Shoemaker because of X, Y, and Z. And so, um, you know, what we've done is try to, and, and, obviously it costs more money to implement some of these things uh, and throw money out there. So, you know, why people are leaving the firm or why are they not coming to the, to the firm or to businesses? It's, I mean, I think it's a lot of those. I'd be curious to see what others have said, but um, for us, it has been more money in other places potentially. Um, but, you know, we're not uh, um, a workhorse grinded out 24 seven working on the weekends, every weekend kind of place either flexibility we've i think done a good job kind of addressing that um as far as work from home and continuing on with that but some of the things we're going to talk about today i'm sure is okay what does that mean for productivity and for culture which we've talked a lot about in in prior weeks prior months prior years now um and you know sometimes it's and, and for us i don't think it's a toxic culture i think that um, but I know others that are in that and they're like, okay, I just dread going to work. You know, that's Sunday night, Monday morning. It's like, oh my gosh. Or in some cases it's Tuesday morning because there's three, three a day work weeks for being in the office, which we'll also talk about. So, um, and then we have kind of a varying policy as far as uh, if you need to be in the office, not in the office, most of the staff is required to be in the office just because of productivity purposes. But um, I would love for us personally to have more attorneys back in the office uh, just for collaboration, but also mentorship, which yeah. also maybe we'll, we'll touch on as well. So that's yeah. my kind of the what's going on here in my world. Great point. And Kirk hit us in the chat. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, I haven't had people leave. 
you are one of the very few that we hear about, which is congratulations. So there's not an option for this on the survey. My bad, I created the survey. So uh, because that he could not finish the poll or submit it. So uh, Kurt, I think Kirk should get a Starbucks gift card for that because they haven't had anybody leave. So congratulations. Uh, what you didn't really get a handle on, well, but was there more than one? <laughs> <laughs> He's a sole proprietor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was telling kids, well, I can't fire myself. It's a nice part of this job. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's funny. All right, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and share results. So the bulk of you have, yes, you have had issues and frustration with people leaving or attracting and retaining. Interesting, um, more money. I, I'm, I'm very surprised about this one, that more flexibility wasn't one of the answers. Um, I'm really <laughs> shocked by that. Now, granted, it's only seven people, but nonetheless, more advancement and responsibility, more money. Um, just to to share, you know, and be honest with you guys, um, we had a person leave less than a year ago because we we quite frankly dropped the ball. We had not kept uh, our eye on the ball and given this guy a clear path for where's his advancement, and he didn't he didn't see it and. Of course, people were throwing all kinds of money, so he took it, and he's getting a boomerang next next um, in the next couple of weeks because he's come back, <laughs> and we're we're thrilled to have him back. But we, you know, we had to pay attention. We're like, man, uh, we got to we got to up our game. We hate losing people that we really love and care about. And we've had a couple people recently that just switched careers. They're just like done with the career and like, okay. Um, so you can't really change that. You're, I'm, I'm actually quite shocked about this one. What's your current in-office work policy? Three out of the seven, hundred percent in the office, which is really interesting. I'd love to hear from anybody in that hundred percent in the office. Is it because of the, the nature of work that requires that, or is it because that's just the way you want it to be? And have you had any pushback? Um, so that would be very interesting. And four out of seven, the majority in hybrid, which seems like hybrid's here to stay, but um, I'm going to go ahead and close that out. A couple of things on the chat. Um, so, Kirk says, in general, I've seen people leave companies for better pay, better training, better management, better scheduling, better working conditions, and better opportunities for advancement. I've seen much higher employee retain, retainment and productivity when companies offer equity to employees, they feel more connected. Yeah, that sense of ownership is a real, real deal. We've got some folks that have ESOPs and established ESOPs for that reason. Um, all right, well, Scott, why don't you introduce yourself and talk to us about some of the trends that you're seeing differences in 2023 versus what we saw maybe in 2019 pre-pandemic and maybe even in the middle of the pandemic. I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you're seeing. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm Scott Pullen. Uh, I work for Sherpa, which is a Charlotte-based recruiting firm. Um, we recruit anything from accounting, finance, HR, marketing, uh, executive support type positions. Um, excited to be here, uh, hang out with you guys. You guys are already a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, excited to kind of to, to pitch in. Uh, but uh, I've been at Sherpa on and off because I am a Boomerang employee. Uh, been at Sherpa on and off uh, since 2016. Uh, and my current stint is going on five years at the end of this month. Um, so I am somebody who uh, I've, I've lived it, even though it was pre, pre-pandemic. Uh, but there, there are a lot of things that have changed uh, from now versus during pandemic versus pre-pandemic. We all know that. Uh, 
one of the things uh, that I know we're going to get into is retention, uh, but people don't really kind of think about it. it. All starts with when you're hiring and kind of the expectations you set. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, I know you and I uh, beforehand we were ch chatting about purpose, and I fully believe that's the best the best way to hire the right person. You know, it, does your purpose align with our purpose? Uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to figure that out in an interview process mm -hmm. because candidates, I'm sure you guys have all, have all gone through this, uh, either as a candidate yourself or hiring somebody, you know, you kind of get the same responses, right? You hear the same thing. Oh, you know, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and it's hard to kind of sift through all of that for, okay, I, I get, yeah, you want to help the team. You want to grow all that good stuff, but what do you really want out of your next position? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's really, really tough to get. Um, but I think it all starts there for, are we hiring the right person? And then, uh, are we going to keep them because money it's, you know, there's always going to be more money out there for another, uh, for another company could be in town, could be, you move across the country, um, anything in between, but, uh, it really comes down to what do you want out of this role? Um, so I'll kind of stop there. I know that was a little bit all at once. Uh, Gary, what do you what do you think about that? I think that's really interesting that you said it's really about starting up front and and really setting expectations and doing as much probing as you can. I know this for a fact that I, as a non CPA, love love, love my job at a CPA firm, <laughs> which I would have never thought, but it is because I saw their purpose. I saw BGW's purpose uh, with their vision traction organizer. We use EOS uh, to help scale and grow our company with an outside coach. And I saw to make a positive or to make a difference in the lives of our employees or our team our clients and our community. And I'm like, hmm. I wrote my purpose in 2003 after reading Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And mine was to make a positive difference in the lives of others. And then understanding a little bit more about, you know, this, this firm, it's not just about doing tax returns. Quite frankly, we would still be in business if they adopted the Steve Forbes you know, mail it in on a postcard because most business owners understand their business and their industry, but they don't understand how to, where the levers are on how to make money and make it, make sense of it. They, they weren't finance majors, et cetera, most of them. And, and getting privately held business owners healthy has a huge impact on our, our country on, and our, our cities and our communities. Uh, it's not the Bank of America's, no disrespect to the big companies, but it's it's the small and medium sized privately held businesses that are the economic engine. And that's our passion. And that is, you know, if you can tap into somebody's purpose, they will run through brick walls and do the right thing when it's inconvenient or whatever, because the carrots and sticks only last so and so much, you know, you'll get short term capitulation, but not long term, you know, heartstrings. And so I know that, you know, this CPA firm had purpose and we're, we're pretty serious about it. So I, I think it's pretty interesting. So got a, a chat message in here from Matt. Um, in too many traditional employers, utilities, hospitals, universities, cities, HR and comp policy are so focused on setting and enforcing rules to be fair, it becomes necessary and strategic to leave in order to get a significant bump in pay and responsibility. Oh boy, that is the truth. Yeah, that, that existed before <laughs> the pandemic because that used to be the running joke at Ernst & Young is, hey man, you didn't get the raise you want, leave for a year. <laughs> yeah, that is the truth. <laughs> so, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, and relatedly to that, you have the issue of <clears throat> before the pandemic, a trajectory of 
increases in compensation <clears throat> and now you have expectations that are higher. So now you have rate compression with having less senior people wanting to get paid as if they are more senior um, compensation. And you're having a collision between that line of bump ups and the line for more junior people that is converging. And yeah. it creates a lot of difficulties in telling either either way, telling your older people that, yeah, this is what the market is bringing. And and then, you know, the younger people, well, we can't pay you that because we're 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 on a certain structure. And then you throw in a multi-state company that has different standards of living, cost of living in different markets. And then you throw all that into the hopper and trying to figure out what is fair is can be very difficult. That is the truth. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll also say if you do get somebody who aligns with your purpose, then you have to worry about everything else, but it all starts, starts there. Uh, and if you look at reasons why, uh, why employees are leaving organizations, you know, Hey, I left for more money or I left for, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, or you look at the, the points that people are searching for those change. I mean, everything evolves over time, but in a way it's kind of one big circle, right? It all kind of goes, goes round. Uh, what we were hearing at the beginning of the pandemic was, you know, we don't want to go back in office. Uh, and you know, we want more money and the market ca has kind of adjusted to that. And then it was, well, now we want more training. Now the market has adjusted to that. So what I'm advising, uh, business leaders that I, that I work with on a regular basis is, you know, we have to figure out what are people asking for now and let's go ahead and solve that problem because that's why you're potentially going to lose people. Even if, you know, somebody is mission aligned or purpose aligned, you know, they're going to still want more training uh, or they're still going to want more money. That one is always at the top of the list pretty much every year. Benefits as well. But if you're looking at uh, what people are searching for now, that's, that's going to be gone in three years. Uh, and over time, there are going to be new areas to, uh, to focus on. So being able to adapt uh, for the retention purpose uh, is, is huge, but training right now is at the top of, of everybody's list that I'm, that I'm working with and talking to. Well, Scott, you know what, I think what would be helpful for me to hear and Jack to hear, and hopefully for our audience to hear is like, you know, I get that, you know, someone comes to Sherpa because, Hey, I'm looking for a new job. Can you guys help me like that? I got that. Like they're seeking you out, but there's this whole other category of stuff that you do where you're you're recruiting for positions with within and try and finding people who already have jobs <laughs> that weren't necessarily looking, which I think is the 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 cat because that's our employees, you know. Like, can yeah. you without without giving away the secret sauce, you know, <laughs> what what is it that you're what is it that you're saying? that that is getting mm. someone to actually eat like what what are the characteristics where you find them like that you know that perfect storm of like you know i'm just pissed off enough that i won't leave <laughs> but if something came along i wouldn't stay <laughs> you know like what's the what what's that secret ingredient of like found them at the right time that you guys see so that we can all learn how to avoid that and make your job just a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah. You know, Ad, Adam, it's it's okay to use the the P word, the bad P word, poaching. <laughs> yeah, um, no, yeah, that's what you yeah. do. Yeah, I know you're getting it. Yeah. So we're talking about poaching, just so to be clear. I'm not allowed to use that word internally because, you know, that's bad. But um, yeah. yes, that's what we're talking about. So Matt or Scott, please tell us. Yeah, I mean, par part of it is timing, right? Somebody has a bad day, a bad week, uh, depends on... Uh, the field, right? Like if you're going after somebody in public accounting, you know, there's a certain time of year where you know, hey, they're they're going to be done with a boatload of work and they are going to be ready to hear about new opportunities. So it yeah. depends on the industry, depends on the the field. 
Uh, but a lot of it comes down to, I don't have the exact percentage in front of me, but it's over 75% of people will at least have a conversation, right? They'll hear out a recruiter for various reasons. And it doesn't always have to be because they're looking for a new job. It could be because I want Intel on what is the market paying, right? I want to make sure I'm being paid fairly. And if I'm not talking to recruiters or hiring managers, about positions, roles, and responsibilities. How am I supposed to know? Because you can get lost on Google, right? I mean, it, it can take you down rabbit holes where next thing you know, you're gonna be thinking you're, you're worth a million dollars and yeah. you're doing data entry. Uh, so part of it is, is, is that knowing people are open to at least an exploratory conversation. Uh, from there, uh, just to kind of, you know, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit. Uh, recruiting is a is a sales position, right? So you got to make things seem appealing. Uh, you have to have a good candidate experience. And most recruiters just focus on the first part, sales, mm -hmm. right? I, I joke around uh, with uh, with people that I work with. Uh, in, in various capacities saying, when has a recruiter ever told you something bad about a company or a position? <laughs> yeah, never. Right, never. It, it's perfect. No, the grass it's perfect. is totally greener. You know, we don't use insecticides. There's no pesticide. You'll never have right. to mow, by the way. There's a lot crew that comes by. It's right. A bunch of BS. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's pretty sad in, in my eyes because that goes against my, my you know, kind of core recruiting, uh, just what I feel responsibility, right? You got to tell somebody the good, the bad, the ugly. And if it's the right fit, it's the right fit. Um, if it's not, I'm moving on and I'm trying to find the person who is the right fit, who matches that purpose, that skill set, and, and wants to move and leave. Um, but uh, I mean, there, there are a, a lot of people, the majority of people out there will at least take a phone call. So Adam, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Um, not a whole lot of secret sauce as far as getting the call, but once you have it, it's it's some sales and some some massaging, if you will. Well, I, I guess from that perspective, what would you do to counteract that in terms of, I mean, like some things that come to mind, you know, is to, you know, make sure as the employer, you know, you're, you're very transparent on what the career advancement opportunities are and how to do them and very transparent with like what, what you pay and how you arrive at salary. I mean, what, what should, what should employers be doing, you know, to, to make sure that they're not, in other words, like somebody could pick up the phone and, you know, oh, hey, Scott, that's awesome. Yeah, what do you know? And it's like, come to find out that you're not telling them anything different than they already got. I mean, that that's like, I'm good with that. Like, I'd love it if my guys didn't even pick up the phone, but accepting that they would, I'd love it if they heard, yeah, that actually doesn't sound as good as what I got. Click. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, transparency is is key. Uh, I think we can probably all agree that agree, agree with that to a certain point, um, right? I mean, at, at some point you in a way, stay in your lane. I don't know if that's the, the best way to put it, but uh, as far as compensation, role responsibility, if you have access to any market intel on, hey, you know, this is the average that, uh, that this position for this type of company size, whether it be revenue, employee headcount, whatever it may be, like, you know, this person's getting paid 70K, right? You're getting paid more or with our benefits package it's more or you know you really have to focus on strengths i would say uh, that way when when somebody does get a call most of the time recruiters just focus on salary not even bonus not benefits most of the time in that exploratory call it's like hey you're making 70 well here's 80 right but if you kind of explain to your employees, hey, you know, you're 70 or, you know, market rate 70 and we're paying you 75, but really the kicker is our bonus package, right? Like we're covering whatever it is, or, you know, we have this culture we're building upon that is, you know, not like anywhere else. Hey, we're going to have a chip on our shoulder. Uh, it, it could be anything like that, but I think transparency and having some of that market knowledge, uh, any, any, you know, 
compensation analysis, if you partner with certain people who who have access to that, I think that is is uh, vital. I'm going to uh, interject a couple of things. So we've gotten some comments that have come in and uh, come in through the chat that I think are really interesting. So first one's from Kirk. I've learned to look for three things in the interview process. One, can the, this person do the job? <laughs> if you've ever seen Joe versus the volcano, you got to go watch the opening scene of that. Harry, I know he can do the job, but can he? I know he could get the job, but can he do the job? <laughs> and it's just, it's hilarious. You got to see it. Anyway, can you do the job? Second, is this person truly motivated or aligned with the company's mission? Very good. And then I love this one. Will this person fit? Will this person fit in? We, we kind of like, you know, would we want to have uh, a tea or a beer with this person? You know, would we want to hang with this person or not? Now, we're not looking for next best friends, but we got to have somebody that we actually want to be with too. Um, so that's good, good points there. And then from Matt, he's got a couple things here. One, and oh boy, we, we have some deeply held thoughts on this one that would say yes and amen to this, but it says the best cure to retention issues is a manager check-in once a week. People join companies and quit bad bosses. Woo. <laughs> yes, that is the truth. And especially these millennials are wanting repeated they want mentorship and they want repeated feedback and so we actually have a tool called standout 2.0 where we do weekly check-ins and man that has been an unbelievable thing and uh adp ended up buying that from one of the guys that founded strings finder and um so anyway that and it's not super expensive we're not even adp clients but it's few grand a year and it's unbelievable standout 2.0 for anybody paying attention um then the second thing he says there's leaders who engage and develop professionals create a sense of belonging people leave because they thought what they thought they had is gone or impossible there nothing to lose much to gain or why not didn't see myself going anywhere anyway man you gotta write a book here, Matt, because that's that's some good stuff. You you know what you're talking about. Another perspective on the developing leaders and mentorship <laughs> is also um, uh, com bring breeding confidence in your mentees that they are doing something and they come in for that gut check through your door and is like, okay, what is this? Okay, what do you think about this? Now, we I because I was subjected to very professorial mentors. I dare never go into a mentor's office as a young attorney without having multiple choice answers. And so we do that. I do that. You know, it's like, okay, don't come into me with like, like this, like, you know, teenagers do like, oh. um, but come in, you know, with some reasoning and let's discuss it. And then you build confidence in them so that even if it happens two or three more times, just as a gut check, it's probably not going to happen four or five times. If you're not there for those gut checks, you're going to have more senior or, or seasoned professionals, maybe in their third or fourth or fifth years, where you might have expected for them to take the ball and run with it because they've done it many times and they've been patted on the back and they feel good about it. They're going to come to you in their third, fourth, fifth year of practicing or, or doing what they're doing, professional services or doing whatever it is that they're doing for that gut check. And it's going to annoy you because you're going to have to, you know, and I've told some people around here that think about what has happened over the past several years. Think about the interactions. Think about the confidence level of these youngsters that they're do they want to make sure they don't screw up. And you have still expectations that, they shouldn't be asking those questions because they should know how to do that. Well, they haven't been given the foundation of confidence to be able mm -hmm. to do that necessarily moving forward. So I'm fine with, and I encourage people to come and chat with me because we haven't had those interactions in person. And my door is almost always open, except for like, like right now it's not. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it, it's those kind of things. So think about it from that perspective, because some are like, well, you know, video is good enough. It's not good enough. I don't think. I think there needs to be a, a, a better balance 
and a movement towards getting back into the saddle in the work space for that mentorship now you have issues that some as you know as uh, gary said at the beginning a comment from a ceo says you forced me to come back to work or i'm not, i'm i'm quitting and you have that kind of thought process which is good good enough i'm getting it done i'm putting the hours in i'm bringing in the revenue don't mess with me i like my you know like the way i'm doing it now don't mess it up because everything is fine i would say that you, maybe so but the problem is is that every organization has someone or several people who you may not trust as much to be as efficient when they're not in the office with someone watching them and the problem is is that you cannot unless you're very careful about it but it's very difficult to navigate through the haves and the have nots of being able to be trusted to work from home to force them to come into the office which then creates you have to have a policy that applies to everyone and then it's like well you know i was doing fine when i was working at home before you didn't have any complaints why do i have to come back to the office or why do i have to come back to the office when you're granting special exemptions to others mm -hmm. so then you start having this discussion of inequality and possibly discrimination so you got to be careful about those things as well spoken like a lawyer <laughs> I have a non-lawyer question for Scott, though, um, and, and this is this would be revealing kind of the, the secret sauce, some of the secret sauce. But I am curious as to how you get beyond <clears throat> the psychology of someone who is wanting to know more about what opportunities are out there, but are very fearful of having that conversation via email that is owned by their company or even on a company owned line. And so are you you know, seeking out their mobile numbers, their private numbers? Are you doing LinkedIn with them with messaging, but then, you know, okay, what if a company has control over the, the LinkedIn account? Or, you know, for example, there are several people that have access to my LinkedIn account because they help me with the, the social media and the marketing of like this program and, and others. So how do you get beyond the fearful and anxious psychology of someone who wants to wants to hear you out but is fearful of doing that so a lot of it is on linkedin um uh linkedin outreach uh in mails uh and a lot of times people will have their cell phone number and personal email uh under contact information right they may not be open to work or they may not, you know, show any signs of wanting to leave, but they may have their cell phone number. And really, that's that's all that that it takes uh, um, to to give somebody a call or, or reach out. Um, but most of it is on LinkedIn uh, for the types of positions that we recruit for. I mean, they're all just very professional, more corporate roles. Uh, so most people do have have a LinkedIn uh, on top of just our internal applicant tracking system. I mean, we've been around for over 20 years. Every resume that's ever been put into our, our applicant tracking system, anybody who's ever applied to a position we've had posted, that resume is in there and that contact information is in there. Um, so we have a, a pretty large database of, of uh, resumes, whether they're old, new, uh, on top of LinkedIn. That's, that's really kind of the approach that we take. Uh, but more so what's the most successful are just referrals, word of mouth, uh, right? Like if, if we're talking to somebody and, and, and I, I guess I should back up. I think that's probably true for most anything, right? You're going to trust somebody that is, that, you know, that's going to say, Hey, go talk to Johnny about Joe. Right. Uh, so we, we do a lot with referrals and just kind of, having a, a presence in the, in the Charlotte market being, being, uh, you know, Charlotte founded Charlotte based people, people tend to know who Sherpa is, which is, which is a, a luxury, I would say. Yeah, Scott, maybe you could answer, um, you know, the recidivism would be the term that I'm looking for, but basically, you know, Hey, Gary, you know, 
I really have this great opportunity for you. Ah, you know, I don't know if I'm interested, but you know, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on it learn more. Learn, oh, that sounds like a great offer. I'm going to leave my existing company, take this offer. Two years later, Gary's knocking at Scott's door saying, Hey man, looking for something new. What else you got? Like how, mm. how many, how many retreads do you guys typically like mm. get versus like, Nope, place to minute stuck. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's, it's hard for us to track retention because we would have to have a, a time period to, to track it, right? Are they, are they staying there a year? Is that good enough? Are they staying there two years? Data, just looking for anecdotal. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. But um, so we don't, we don't track any of that, but uh, we do get quite a bit of, Hey, you know, I'm in this position. I've been here for two years, five years, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, I think I've kind of capped out. Uh, or we got some new leadership and things are moving in a direction. I'm, I'm not looking, looking to, you know, buy into, uh, keep an eye out for me. Uh, so that, that certainly does happen quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's a, a good thing because that means that we built trust and we had a really good candidate experience, uh, with that individual who was going through a very hard and stressful time, you know, looking for a job, whether you're interviewing or whether you're not looking for a job, but just interviewing in general, usually people are, are, are very stressed and anxious. Um, so if they come back to us, I think that's a really, a really powerful thing. It shows we, we did things right. We did things, uh, in, in a, in a very ethical and moral way, which in recruiting is, is tough to, uh, tough to do. Cause if we lose, we don't get paid but sometimes it's better for the individual and usually it, it is. So yeah. happens a lot. Yeah. I hear you. It, it sounds like it's really good for you. What I'm also hearing is the employer is like, well, look, I mean, I kind of sold Gary a bill of goods, you know, like I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily deliver on mm. what I said. So like, to me, it's kind of a further data point of like, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, let's keep on continually aligning on, you know, our mutual expectations um of each other mm -hmm. you know yeah a lot. i mean we we probably spent 200 grand last year in recruiting fees that i wasn't you know love you scott but i was not looking to spend <laughs> you know? yeah yeah no <laughs> i wasn't that was that was not something that at the start of the year i was like you know what i want to spend money on recruiting fees <laughs> just... i i definitely get that and i mean if, if you guys have hired yourself. I'm sure everybody has here. Um, it's a lot of time and work, a lot, yeah, a lot of is. time and work. Um, and that is the really good and the really bad thing about recruiting is you're dealing with people. And uh, what I tell what I tell individuals who get into recruiting or who hire uh, is at any given point, a candidate and or hiring manager, they're going to either lie to you or change their mind. And yeah. If you're a recruiter, you are stuck in the middle and you're trying to navigate that, that dance. Um, so it's, so it is tough, but ultimately, you know, the good ones, in my opinion, try to do it for the right reasons. So, but I get it. You don't want to pay a lot of money for, for talent um, if, yeah. if you don't have to. And I think, it, I think the other piece of that too, it's like, I don't want to, I mean, you guys have, you know, the contracts that you have for a reason, but the worst is when you place it, pay the fee, you've already, you've already hit the expiration point on now it's Scott's problem to find another person because they waited just long enough. Um, so what, Yeah. sometimes it's been out of our control, you know, like they, they took the job and said yes, knowing full well what they were getting into. Um, and then they just left anyway. I, I guess if you were to say, you know, kind of top, top two or three things, hey, if you're hiring somebody through a recruiting firm and paying the fee, this is this is the top two or three things you got to get right mm -hmm. in that first year if you don't want to have to pay the fee again. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean that's definitely an approach. Uh, I mean it, it's. Well, no, I'm just I'm asking. Yes, no, you. no, asking no, 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 no. I know. I mean, you, I'm. What's your it, opinion of what I got to get right so that I don't? It's, I don't have to pay the same fee twice for the same role. Well, I, I know, I, and and what I'm trying to say is like it's it's an approach, but it's it's almost an impossible one because you're dealing with people. Yeah. I uh, so, I mean, you could, you could set out all the expectations, you could find out the purpose, but you know, a spouse gets a better job and they have to move cross country. Yeah. Um, or, 
they uh, unfortunately, you know, don't have enough childcare support. So now got to, you know, go back home. It could yeah. be, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Yeah, so it's, I, I it's tough. It. In my experience, that's been, that's been the very small exception is that someone has come to me and said, man, Adam, I really love this place, but a life circumstance changed such that I have it more often than I say, hey, no, it just wasn't what I expected. <laughs> Yeah. Is, would I mean is that in a specific field or on a specific team? Um, it uh, I can't. I mean, I couldn't put I couldn't put a rhyme or reason to it. You know, in other words, like it, it's you. Um, <laughs> I feel like everybody else is just listening. This is turning into Adam's counseling session. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, well, how about how about we ask it this way? Is that I think what you're what you're asking, Adam, is um, what are the, maybe the top three things that uh, prospects come to you and say that they are unhappy with? So, or is it that you're just seeing a bunch of young people that are just playing hopscotch with salary yeah, numbers, really, you know, yeah. kind of thing? So, what what are you seeing as the, the biggest complaints? Which would essentially be what Adam is asking: is what what are the companies not delivering on? And is it really a company issue or is it just somebody who's just saying, well, this is how you play the game, which is, yeah, you do hopscotch until you get to the point where you're happy with your salary, you're happy with your job, and you would only take the next step if it was really an, uh, a, a significant increase on the, the, the promotion rung, the promotion ladder. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think you kind of mentioned it for the, to generalize the, the younger, you know, professionals in the workforce, they are going to play hop, hopscotch for the most part. They are going to jump around, get those increases, get, you know, hey, let me try to figure out what I want to do, right? I may have gone to school for this. I may have done this for a year or two, but I don't want, I don't want to do this for the next 40 years. So for, for the younger generation who's getting into the workforce, that's going to be a thing. But if you look historically, that's how it is for most every generation when they first get into the workforce mm -hmm. uh when you get into that you know kind of mid-career early to mid-career it is hey i want to grow to be a manager i want to lead a team you know most people want to want to figure that out uh the best people realize they're either good at it or they're not and they either stay and or they get out of it um so wanting to lead a team is a is a big thing uh and the second biggest thing is is training depending on the role, uh, a lot of, a lot of people leaves because, Hey, this other company can offer me training, uh, that you can't, you don't have time. We're already, you know, two men down and I'm just trying to, you know, hold on. And, you know, I, I, I want to grow, I want to learn more, but we don't have time for that. And how about, um, kind of switching gears and going into maybe a little more objective statistical is there a general number that you would say is the cost of bringing onboarding someone and essentially the cost of if you lose them and have to restart other than the recruiting fee but would you say it's a percentage of their and and again i understand this may be a difficult question to answer because it, it's going to depend on the amount of training that's required, the position that's required, all those things, the logistics of, okay, is there like five layers of security and, and everything else associated with that? But is, is there some statistics related to maybe a percentage of the annual salary that is the cost for losing someone so quickly? Or is there a general number that you would say it's, you know, at least 30K because that's what it costs? So is, is there any data on that? Yeah, it, it depends on the role, but it's anywhere from uh, roughly 10 to, to 40K uh, for, for most positions. Um, and that's usually by month. Okay. So you're saying 10 to 40K per month. If, uh, you, don't, if you don't hire the position or if it doesn't work out, if that position, if that seat is vacant uh, and no work is getting done or people have to take on work, um, you know, you're, you're potentially uh losing out on 10 to 40k okay what about the investment that is put into an employee that then bails after three months is there a statistical number related to that either percentage or dollar amount on average you know i don't have that okay 
good question. It, like I, said, I think it would yeah. it would vary pretty significantly, but I don't know if if the, you know the the studying historical data would say, well, it's maybe you know five percent or ten percent of annual salary uh, per month, or even you know for the period of time, assuming that it's you know three months within three months. So uh, the data probably exists somewhere, but maybe it's not, or maybe it's just too wide of a range to even be st statistically significant in, in in the first instance but i know that it cost us a lot of money when you know there there have been times where it seems like revolving door going on and we you, know, you have to figure out why that's happening and put a stop to it which we've done um in the past and so um but i you know for us i know what it costs us to lose somebody because our hr people very much tell us okay what yeah. happened you understand that losing this person means this as far as a cost to you as an owner so um it, it, i guess you should know it as an owner i would suggest that you know what the cost is the investment is for a hire including maybe the recruiting fee if this person were to leave and maybe that's an incentive to you know look around and make sure you're doing the right things and asking the right questions and talking to them doing all those things that we've talked about that you should be doing with employees to make sure that they are happy and they're being fulfilled you know fulfilled and everything else so anyway yeah no i, I mean if i just think anecdotally you know here at bgw you know it, it's it, it's at least a year of pay, you know, in some respects, because, you know, the, the new person that replaces them is not as, not as productive because they got to come up to speed on the client. They're just not going to get the same volume done in that first year, you know, and then, and then they're going to have to learn some of the intangible skills that are specific to BGW and someone has to teach them those intangible skills. So that person mm -hmm. is not actually able to do the job that they were meant to do because they're too busy training and teaching the new person that they they wouldn't have had to train had we not lost a person. And that that's not even factoring in the opportunity cost of like what I could have been doing with my time if I wouldn't happen to train a new person combined with, you know, again, how, how does Gary feel when it's like, I know you love Timmy. <laughs> But Timmy decided to leave, and here's uh, Joey. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that you know, that's not, you know, that's not insurmountable. But if Joey doesn't do a great freaking job, and then it's Sally, you know, I can sort of start the death march <laughs> of now I have a lost client that I'm dealing with, <laughs> you know, from a from a turnover standpoint. So it, you know, it's a real deal for us. Yeah. Um, Bruce weighed in on this and he said, there's a lot of talk about people coming off the sidelines to come back into the workforce. Do you have additional screening or risk assessment approaches to validate that they have the skills and commitment to restart a career? Good question. I mean, I know for us, we, we give our candidates a lot of assessments depending on what, uh, what field they're in. Um, which, you know, can be thought of in, in a few different ways. You know, it's, you're taking a test, right? Uh, is everybody a good test taker? No. Do people, does that show, do you know what you're talking about? It does. Um, but, uh, uh, we use assessments a lot for, uh, for our accounting finance, uh, HR roles. Okay. Do, you, do you do the new, uh, college level assessments where, by the way, you have to use the camera on so we can trace your eyes and, you know, we're monitoring to make sure you didn't pull up the browser to <laughs> go Google the answer, you know, we... you <laughs> looked at your, oh, I got that. I got the phone now. <laughs> yeah, we, we do not. I used to um, actually administer assessments in person though, um, back, back, uh, probably back in 2016 yeah. or 17. Um, yeah. But no, we don't do that. <laughs> I got a question for you as we're, you know, nearing the top of the hour. Let's think back a year ago or so. Money was flying into, you know, people's minds and offers like I'd never seen. 
I don't think ever before. Um, maybe during the height of the dot com, you know, in the dot com crazy stuff, and it is usually in the form of phantom stock or whatever. But um, are people still throwing tons of money, or is that backed off a little bit in the last year? It's backed off significantly for basically everything except uh, CPA level candidates. Interesting. Uh, that's great news. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, this is what I want to hear. Great. Well, being, so, I'm, I'm being real over here, so. <laughs> I'm <in the> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, thanks for that. It's funny. <laughs> Up until was it a year ago? We never, we've, we'd never lost a, an employee to a, a competing CPA firm. Never. We've, we've lost good people to our clients, which is a problem. <laughs> but, and we've never stood in the way of that. But what's interesting to me is both of these people that were offered a lot more money have both asked us to hire them back. And one of them, uh, we said, thanks, but no. Um, and so I just think it's interesting. I mean, the money's great for the first two paychecks. And then all of a sudden, that loses its luster. <laughs> it's so it's like, what did I just sign up for? And I think that's a really important thing. Um, I'm going to just do a little recap of some things that I heard in my words, but just from this conversation on increasing odds for retention, one is to make sure expectations, purpose and fit and culture are addressed up front. That's a big one. So thank you for hitting that. Routine communication and feedback, which uh, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was that, that had Matt, I think. Uh, so that was good. A clear path on where you're going, you know, of the opportunity for that, those employees, competitive compensation, we really didn't talk about it. But if you don't have competitive compensation, you're really kind of out, I think. And then final thing was just training, you know, people, we got to keep investing in training. So and I know that we put a lot of money and time in that in the last year in particular, it's like, and it's good, it's, it's upping our game. So um, any other thoughts before we wind it up at, at the 12 o'clock hour? No, I, I appreciate, I appreciate the input, Scott, a lot. Um, cause it, it, it is, you know, it is one of those, uh, baffling, you know, items that, man, if you, if you can really get this piece right, you know, it's amazing. Now, honestly, it's like it, you hear, I, I don't remember who said it, but, you know, it's effectively culture Trump strategy. For breakfast every day you know that's just totally that's totally that's totally true you know and yet it's so baffling on how to you know how to get it right you know especially with this kind of change with the kind of changes that have happened so i appreciate the wisdom that you shared yeah thank you scott for sharing i mean there, there's so many i have so many questions to ask if we had more time um and i didn't want to dominate the conversation but yeah i mean there's just you know it's like hey scott what do you think about this or what do you think about that so um and then, so maybe it's this is right for another session down the road um and we uh, appreciate maybe you making another cameo appearance down the road to discuss more of this stuff because uh as you said i i, I totally agree that what we talk even what we talk about today is going to be different than maybe we talk about in the next several months a year or two years from yeah. now because of what motivates people the work environment technology all those things that are forces on the workforce and what the expectations of employers and employees are so um, again thank you for sharing yeah scott thanks for jumping into the the ring of fire with us <laughs> it's always fun <laughs> it, it was fun i i appreciate you guys for for having me uh would be more than happy to come back at any point and if anybody has any further questions feel free you can reach out to me on linkedin or or wherever you can call into sherpa ask for me uh, but uh always happy to help the best i can yeah, and if you do that, just mention that this is the 170th weekly webinar, and he'll give you a 25% off. <laughs> and just give us 10% referral commission. <laughs> Money for everybody. We're throwing, than... we're throwing it around. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a wonderful rest of the week. See y'all. Right, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.